Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight I'm going to show you the processing workflow I used on my latest image, the Cygnus Loop. The uh, Cygnus Loop is a supernova remnant and many people know parts of it by, uh, by the name of the Veil Nebula. So we have the Eastern and Western Veil Nebula and we also have Pickering's Triangle. Those are like the three main structures within this nebula. Uh, right here you can see that I've got uh, one panel. This, so this is a two panel mosaic that I created. I did use the um, uh, the 65 PHQ uh, telescope and the camera was the ZWO ASI 294 Mono. I did use bin 2 on this one and I think it actually hurt me a little bit uh, but we'll go into that later. So this is the uh, HA uh, stacked uh, image here and if I go over here we can see the other half of it. Now a couple of years I posted a video on my YouTube channel that went through specifically how I do mosaics and I use the same method uh, for this shot that I did in that video two years ago. So I'll include a link in the description to that video if anyone wants to see the mosaic process in detail. I'll go over it very quickly in this video just to give a general idea but if you're looking for more detailed instructions that would be the video to watch. Now each panel uh, the left and right uh, has about 20 hours of total exposure in them so about 40 hours total on this completed image. All capturing was done without the moon because it's a mosaic and mosaics are very sensitive to uh, gradients in particular light pollution gradients and definitely moon gradients even with the narrowband filters if you want to get the two panels to look as seamless as possible then you want the night sky condition to be the same for all of the data and the easiest way for me to do that is just limit my capturing on this target when there was no moon out. Alright so the basic process is doing a channel combination of the HA and O3 uh, you can see that right here for this one. Uh, then we run dynamic background extraction. Then we run blur exterminator. And then we do an initial stretch. Now normally I would remove stars after blur exterminator. But with a mosaic it needs the stars to help line the different frames or panels up. Uh, so uh, I couldn't remove the stars out right away and normally I remove the stars for my images while it's still linear but again the mosaic process it, it's more successful if the image is stretched and so what I did is an initial stretch it wasn't it was probably about 80 percent of the way and I stretched both panels I had them both in the same workspace and I stretched them to try to get them as close to the same background signal as possible now what you're seeing right here is an unlinked auto stretch of the linear data right after the channel combination. I ran background dynamic, uh, dynamic background extraction and ended up with this here. And this is actually a linked stretch. Uh, if we were to link this one here, um, you'd see the O3 signal is very strong. So dynamic background extraction actually took care of that uh, O3 overcast uh, that was on the image. All right, and next was uh, Blur Exterminator and there's Blur Exterminator doing a fantastic job as usual. Alright so next it was time to stretch. Uh, went over to New Workspace and here you can see there's frame 1 and frame 2. And yeah, I basically just stretched one to, like I said, about 80% of the way. I didn't want to stretch it all the way. I want to give myself some room from a, a processing standpoint after I had created the mosaic. And um, once I got to this point, I started the mosaic process. And for that process, I actually just used the star alignment process in PixInsight. Uh, so yeah, image registration, star alignment, you can already see what I have here. But basically the way it works is the first step is to just put, use one of your images as a reference, one of the frames. You set the registration model with thin plate splines 
and you set this to mosaic and then you run it against the other frame and what that does is it creates what I'll call a rough mosaic uh, which is this here now the purpose of the rough mosaic is that going forward with the um, mosaic creation you're now using the rough mosaic as your reference image it's also a good chance to get a look at at how well the two frames match up now you would expect to see the seam in this because again it's just a rough it's a rough mosaic and normally you do see the seams in this rough mosaic but uh, I did a good enough job of matching the backgrounds in the initial stretch and I think this is really helped by the fact that I only collected data without the moon so the uh, there wasn't a big difference in the um, uh, sky quality and you can see the seam in here but barely so of all the mosaics I've done this here it's most noticeable but this is probably the best looking rough mosaic I got I mean if you zoom out you, you can barely notice any seam there so this was a good sign so anyway once you have your rough mosaic you use your rough mosaic as the reference you change the working mode to register union separate and then you run this process against each of your frames and you end up with this here oh and when you do this you want to have this frame adaption box checked and then after you have these two in order to use the gradient merge mosaic tool which is the the next step to use this guy here in order to use this tool both of the frames need to be exactly the same size and usually when you do this kind of um, uh, register union with the rough mosaic they may not be exactly the same uh, pixel size and so the next step still using the rough mosaic as a reference you change it to uh, to register register match and then you run it against and that's what you see here and the output from this is these here so now these are registered to the rough mosaic and the um, the separate mosaic has been had the frame adaption option enabled so now these are ready for the gradient merge mosaic tool so the next thing you have to do is you have to actually save these because the gradient merge mosaic tool uh, it looks at files not um, objects within the, the workspace here and then when you open it up you just click add files you load the two up in there and uh, for the type of combination I use overlay for the feather radius <clears throat> I think on this one I did 22. Feather radius is one of those tunable options that you have. And then for black point, uh, I always tend to get better results by moving this up at least a little bit. So I moved it to this first position of 0 0.01. And the output of that was this here. Now this does look a little odd. It looks like it's too, um, too bright, almost like it was stretched too much uh, I'm not entirely sure what happened here I've seen this happen a couple of times before I don't know if it was that black point setting that I used or something else but uh, other than this looking too bright it actually looks like it did a good job All right so the seam would would be around here somewhere and I don't see a seam maybe maybe down here all right so yeah I mean if if there's a seam it would be right here and yeah I don't see a seam so this was definitely a successful uh, merge here 
All right, so the next thing I did, I made a clone because I always make clones. <laughs> uh, but then after that, it's basically one a crop. Oh, I did a rotation, right? So, of course, I had to rotate it. Uh, let's back up all the way. It should be a crop, yeah. So I used a dynamic crop to crop out those edges there. And then I rotated the image to a, um, a easier easier way to work on it and then I took the stars off for star removal I just used uh, star exterminator now this kind of um, overstretched hazy background this turned out to be really easy to fix uh, check it out if I just open up histogram alright what do you see here well we need to pull this up. All right, so I just pulled it up right up until it started clipping some of the pixels. I probably could have went further, but basically that's that's all I all I need to do to correct that. And um, should see it here. Yeah, see, so that's all it took. Now from here it was mostly just curves work. And um, I think I continued here. Yeah, I tend to make a lot of clones as I process. And these are large files, so it's taking my computer a little, little bit of effort to keep up with uh, swapping stuff out. Even, even being on an NVMe drive. One of these days I'll make a RAM drive. Yeah, so just minor uh, tweaks and curves. All I'm trying to do is increase contrast mostly. And I got it to this point here. Once I reached this point, I did take the image into Photoshop and I tweaked it in Photoshop, mostly using the um, uh, the dehaze function and some of Photoshop's color functions, the uh, the saturation and vibrant vibrant sliders, and I did tweak the O3 color on here. With with these HOO images, it's always um, I, I sometimes have a hard time deciding just how blue or green I want the O3 signal to be here. Uh, lately, I've been keeping it mostly green because I feel like this. This color that you see right now is pretty close to the natural O3 color, but uh, I decided to go a little bit more blue this time around. And you'll see what I mean. Let me—I I brought it over to a new workspace. So yeah, this is this is where it ended up after running this through Photoshop. So it's a little bit. I mean, it's still. I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not I don't know. This is kind of like a toothpaste color, really. <laughs> I didn't want it to go straight blue uh, but I didn't want it to be green either and so I settled on this color in the middle and um, well that's where I ended up <laughs> so anyway more um, more curves work after this okay so what you're seeing here is this red is kind of this red faint red signal this HA signal I want to get more out of uh, so let's see yeah so this mask is a range mask that is blocking off most of the brighter segments of the of the nebula and then I use curves to increase the red signal and we should see it yeah now I also use noise exterminator and I think this is pretty much the finished starless image. It's a pretty cool target, uh, uh, right? Supernova remnant. So I did a little bit of reading up on, on this target. And apparently it was the type of supernova that would yield a neutron star and not a black hole. So I guess a, a smaller supernova, <laughs> if you want to call it that. To my knowledge, they have not yet found the neutron star that would have been left 
over from this explosion. The center of it is supposed to be right in this area here. Uh, and it's possible that the neutron star is not even in the neighborhood anymore. Uh, kind of looking at the image, and, and I know I'm dig digressing from the processing part, but it's it's kind of interesting to see this, that just my own eyes interpreting the shape, is that if the shape is roughly going to be a sphere, right, I mean, this is clearly one side, the other side, then I'm thinking that this brighter part, which Pickering's triangle is part of, is like in the foreground and this dimmer part might be like in the in the in the background meaning it's further from us than this part like if if you could rotate this whole thing you know to the right or left and see see these outer outer regions on the edge and see these uh kind of like how we see these uh the uh broom and the and the uh, bat, it might be, it would be pretty cool. So I would like, love to see a 3D rendering of this object. Now I mentioned that I ran this in uh, bin two instead of bin one. And that gave me a um, image scale. Oh, I don't remember. I think it was um, around four. Well, actually let's, let's look it up really quick. So we'll go to astronomy tools, imaging mode, it doesn't matter on the target. Telescope is a 65 PHQ. Camera is the ASI 294 MM and we were in bin two mode. There's no reducer. All right, so 2.3 arc seconds, which I don't think is too bad. Uh, if I'd gone to bin one, this would have been 1.15, which, which should be a good bit better. Uh, but anyway, if we zoom in, the image doesn't quite hold up as well. And I wonder if the bin 2 kind of hurt on the detail. It looks like I may have pushed it a bit too much too, if we do this kind of uh, pixel peeping. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's kind of kind of grainy even even after using noise reduction I mean I suppose I could have pushed it more but but I mean it's a wide field image right and so looking at it in its normal state I think it looks fine now I did actually capture some data at bin one I haven't processed it yet I grabbed it just as a a comparison I am planning a bin one bin two comparison video with the 294 uh, so stay tuned for that. All right, uh, on to the stars. Since the stars were already stretched when I pulled them out, uh, it was basically just tweaking the stars a little bit with some curve work to try to decide how bright I wanted them to be. You can see uh, different, right? So these are the smallest stars, and this is with most of the stars and this is actually stars too with an S curve applied. So I made the larger stars a little bit brighter and the smaller stars a little bit dimmer and the final image should be this one here. So the stars were a little bit tricky. Uh, with them really small it actually looked like dust. <laughs> it made the image look kind of dusty. And with the stars too bright, I felt like it obscured the nebula too much. So it was just a matter of finding the right balance. And I think I got pretty close with this. So there it is. Uh, my version, my 2023 version of the Cygnus Loop in HOO. Um, maybe I'll go back and try this again, but get some sulfur data next time. Alright, so don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and have some clear skies.